I'm Kaylee, and this is my November reading wrap up. I don't even really know what happened in November. I mean, I read a lot, but I just, my reading was just kind of chaotic. I wasn't reaching my goals. I wasn't reading the things that are actually on my TBR. I just kept picking up random stuff. And sometimes that's just what you need. Sometimes you just need to pick up whatever random thing appeals to you in the moment. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe to this channel and give this video a big thumbs up. If you like to just read random whatever that isn't meeting your goals, but you just, you're a mood reader and you wanted to read whatever. Let's get into some of the statistics of my November reading. I read eight graphic novels. I read five picture books, three nonfiction, 12 activity or craft type books, two fiction and three middle grade. So a total of 33 books in November, not too bad. A lot of those were graphic novels. <laughs> so of course I read Agatha Christie's Murder on the Links and I've already done a separate video about that one. So I will link that up above and down below and you can go and see all my thoughts about Agatha Christie. I loved that one so much. I also finished up reading the manga series Silver Spoon. So I've read the last five volumes, volumes 10 through 15, and I just, I loved this manga so much. I got really attached to the characters, especially the main character, Hachiken. I know I'm saying that wrong, but yeah. It was so amazing to see through the entire series all of his character development. He's just very unsure of himself and he really doesn't know what he's doing in the beginning. He starts to attend this agricultural high school and he is a city boy. He doesn't know anything about livestock or farming or anything, but gradually he begins to make friends with his classmates and he he just works really hard and he gains their respect and admiration because he's just so determined. And in these last few volumes, then we start to see where he is reaping the fruits from all his effort. Also in these last volumes, we finally get to see the budding romance between Hachiken and the girl that he likes. They've been dancing around each other for the entire series and we finally get to see them get together. I thought their whole friendship and then their romantic relationship is just so pure and innocent. They are just so sweet and adorable together and I loved that whole storyline. Every volume is so funny and just had me laughing my head off <laughs> through every single chapter. I think I gave every single volume in Silver Spoon four or five stars. I just loved the whole series so much. All the rest of the books in this video are books that I received from a publisher in exchange for a free and honest review. So I read Danny Chung sums it up. Danny is Asian American and he is dismayed when his grandmother comes from China. She does not speak any English and she moves in with his family and he has to share his bedroom with his grandmother. However, eventually those two learn to communicate and Danny learns to love his grandmother and appreciate her fierce spirit, especially when Danny has a huge math project that is coming up and he hates math. But then he finds out that his grandmother was a math champion back in the day. And they kind of use math to overcome this language barrier because math is its own language. This was such a sweet and heartwarming story. I loved the plot. I loved all the little details about Danny's close-knit family and learning more about Chinese culture. I was super impressed with the grandmother. She is fierce and intelligent and kind. Now I will say there are a lot of references to like vomit and poop and farting. I mean, it's a middle grade book that is geared towards boys. So I did not enjoy those aspects of the book, but you know, that's perfect for the target audience. So that sort of took it down like half a star for me. And then I took off another half star because I was appalled at one reference, just one sentence where Danny says that he used to take violin lessons, but he says it was torture. And so he quit. He also says that he played badly on purpose so that his parents would let him quit. I, I am absolutely appalled. I'm a music teacher. I mean, I'm a piano teacher, not violin, but I've taken, I've taken violin lessons before. I took three years of violin in college. I just find this so horrible. 
horribly offensive. And I really worry that children that read this will come away with a very bad impression of music lessons. If your music lessons are torture, then you need to find a better teacher, okay? You, music lessons do not have to be torture. My students are always telling me that they have fun in their lessons. And I, I kind of understand that they're trying to subvert these Chinese stereotypes and they're trying to show that not all Chinese people are good at math and not all Chinese people are good at music. You know, people have their own individual skills and talents and you can't take a whole people group and just say, all Chinese people know math or all Chinese people know karate or something silly like that. But you didn't have to bad mouth music lessons in order to get that point across. You could have just said Danny didn't enjoy his lessons. You didn't have to say they're torture. I mean, goodness. Ugh. Thanks a lot for discouraging the entire next generation of musicians. This is why there's a musician shortage right now. Because kids don't want to take music lessons because they have this idea in their minds that it's not fun or not cool or something. I don't know. Anyway, that made me mad. <laughs> I ended up giving it four stars. It is a lovely book. It is so much fun and talks about really deep themes and important issues and in, in just a really fun and interesting plot. But those two little things that just got on my nerves. So it took it down a little bit of a star there. I read a couple more manga classics. So they just came out with a new modern English edition of Romeo and Juliet. So they already had another edition of Romeo and Juliet with the same artwork and everything, but it was the original words of Shakespeare. And now they've come out with this new modern English translation. And it is perfection. I gave it five stars. If I could give it 10 stars, I absolutely would. I'm so impressed with the way that the text was modernized, but it kept all the integrity of Shakespeare's original intent. And of course, I adore the beautiful artwork that brings the story to life. The art in this one especially, because Romeo and Juliet is a romance, the artwork is very delicate. It's just really attractive, and I love the designs for each character. It makes each character really memorable. This would just be the perfect perfect way to introduce someone to Shakespeare's plays if they're just really intimidated by the Elizabethan language. I will say though, this isn't really appropriate for um, young readers or for teenagers because, I mean, if y'all have read any Shakespeare, you know Shakespeare liked to make sexual jokes. And some of that is just not quite appropriate for younger audiences, okay? Shakespeare, man, he... He kind of had a potty mouth, a little bit there. So, mm, proceed with caution. And I also read the modern text version of Macbeth. Macbeth has never been one of my favorites of Shakespeare's plays. It's just too bloody and gory and, and really kind of scary for me. But if you like dismal adventure with plenty of violence and gore, then you would certainly love Macbeth. Again, I am very impressed with the way that the text has been modernized without losing any of the integrity of Shakespeare's words. There's no like jarring modern slang to take you out of that time period. It doesn't ruin the beauty of the lines. In fact, most of the poetry is actually still there. All the flavor, all the emotion of the original text is absolutely still there. I do really love the design for certain characters in this artwork because the heroes have like the square jaws and everything. They have those clear eyes and when they make some big speech, like that emotion really comes through on the page. Every character is just, has such a striking appearance. I found it especially interesting to see how Macbeth's demeanor changes after he has committed murder. His posture and his facial expressions are different and shadows kind of gather around him. And you can just see this descent into darkness in the play. It's so fantastic. I wish I could give it 10 stars, but Goodreads only lets me do five. The author of The Captain's Daughters was so kind to send me a copy for review, and I loved this little middle grade sci-fi. The cover, I feel like, almost makes it look more like a fantasy, but it is very much a sci-fi. Diane and Robin are two sisters who are kidnapped by an alien race, and they are to be sold as slaves on a faraway planet. Their father, who is a starship captain, is searching for them, but he will 
have to travel farther than anyone thought possible in order to rescue his daughters. However, Diane and Robin are not just sitting around waiting to be rescued. They take matters into their own hands and they try a daring escape. I just loved this. It's such a fun adventure. It has some fun little plot twists in there. The writing is really good. I immediately connected with the characters and I was emotionally attached to them. There's a lot of funny dialogue that had me laughing. There's some really good scenes with a lot of suspense. And those girls are so sassy. Oh my goodness. They had some really, really sassy like little one-liners that I was like, ooh just had me laughing so hard. The world building is not particularly imaginative or broad or anything. It just feels like a basic kind of sci-fi, sort of like a Star Trek type kind of setup. I didn't really mind that though because the main focus is so much on the characters and I'm a very character driven reader so the world building was fine. I mean it was good. There was no problems with it um, but it just wasn't like anything super special. I loved Diane and Robin. Speaking of characters, they are some wild little Little girls, they are always getting into mischief. And Captain Marsh, their father, has a very strong personality. I really loved the complexity of his character. I thought that was just so well done. It was just so fantastic to see the sisters and their father and just like, oh, it's so heartwarming. I really liked this book and I gave it three and a half stars. I also read Secrets of the Last Merfolk. Finn and Sage begin to wonder if there might be merfolk living in the ocean off the coast of Scotland. They have been seeing strange sights in the water and they've been hearing a weird song that echoes off the rocks. Sage begins to investigate in her kayak, but when Finn decides to do a dangerous solo swim out in the freezing waves, the two discover that the merfolk are more mysterious and strange than they had ever imagined. And the merfolk are in danger from an old enemy, and it's up to Finn and Sage to save this tiny little con colony of mermen and mermaids. I had some issues with this book. The premise sounds so great, and the execution just kind of wasn't there. The plot is incredibly slow. This could have been a short story, but it just drags on and on and on. And then once something finally does happen, it's not really that amazing. And once I finished the book, I kind of realized, wait a minute, Finn and Sage are completely obsolete to any of the plans of the merfolk to ward off their old enemy. Like, the plot makes this big deal about Finn and Sage helping the merfolk, but they never really do anything than the merfolk couldn't have just done themselves and done it better. It was just a lot of fuss over nothing. They didn't even do anything. <laughs> ah. The writing style is good and there's a lot of really emotional scenes. It's just the pacing was way too slow. I did like the legends surrounding the merfolk and there's some kind of history there. I was interested in Finn and Sage's home life. We get really in-depth looks at their families and their different dynamics with their families. But then I kind of felt like we spent too much time with their families and not enough time on the actual mystery of the merfolk. Overall, this book was okay. The characters were good, but the plot was not there. So I ended up giving it two stars. I started reading Quackery, A Brief History of the Worst Ways to Cure Everything. And then I kind of DNF'd it. And I just sort of skimmed a little bit of the spots that looked interesting and I didn't read the rest of it because it was too gross. Some of it was like, oh, nasty. I don't want to read about that gross. Throughout history, people have tried to cure their ailments with all sorts of weird things. Half the time, they were poisoning themselves without realizing it. Sometimes they knew they were poisoning themselves, but they kept doing it anyway, hoping for some sort of lingering benefits. And of course, then there were also con men who would promote supposed cure-all elixirs that would promise youth and beauty and robust health, when really they were poisoning their customers with mercury and arsenic and morphine for babies and all kinds of of awful stuff. I think this book is just too morbid for me. It is certainly interesting and the writing is really excellent. The writing is actually kind of funny. It takes kind of this lighthearted, joking sort of mood toward these really morbid subjects. It's just not quite my cup of tea. I really liked the way the chapters are organized. The layout is very attractive. There's a lot of diagrams and old timey photos and different stuff. There's newspaper clippings and historic paintings. I mean, it's really, for what it is, it's quite an attractive and well put together book, but I just couldn't stomach it. So I gave it three stars. I also read, 
I also read William Shakespeare's Avengers The Complete Works. So in this book, the Avengers movies are retold in Shakespearean style with Elizabethan language. And they're told as if they were theater plays, complete with stage directions. I got inspired reading this to re-watch the movies. So I watched each one right after reading the play, and it was so cool to see the similarities between them. The book actually follows the movie scenes really, really closely, except it's just... It's a theater play with Elizabethan language. It really uses the real style of Shakespeare, sometimes with actual quotes from Shakespeare's plays. And a lot of just the language structure and like little theater tricks and poetic flights of fancy, they all mimic Shakespeare so perfectly. The setting is kind of funny because the actors are dressed up partly in modern dress, you know, like we see them in the movies, and then partly with Elizabethan finery. So they'll have like these neck ruffs and doublets and everything. So some things are old timey and some things are modern and it's just a weird mixture. It is just really fun. I gave this five stars. And next we have some picture books that I read. I read Goodnight Toucan, Violet's Tempest, The Robin and the Fir Tree, and Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening, a beautiful illustrated version of one of my favorite poems by Robert Frost. I also read some activity books and I reviewed some little craft kits that have a tutorial type informational booklet in them. One of those was Where's Waldo? Santa Spotlight Search. I also read two puzzle trains from Familius, the Puzzle Train Christmas and Puzzle Train Alphabet. I reviewed the Pastel Studio, DIY Barrett's Bow's Hair Ties, Kids Magical Baking Cookbook with 25 Enchanted Recipes, Watercolor Wonders, and Paint by Sticker Kids Mermaid's Magic. And I reviewed the Reverse Coloring Book, uh, the book that has the colors and you draw the lines. I also read a couple of cookbooks, The Bake, Make, and Learn to Cook, Fun and Healthy Recipes for Young Cooks. This one is written by one of the winners of the Great British Baking Show, so it's really cool. The other cookbook was Buen Provecho, a traditional Mexican flavors from my cocina to yours. This one brought me back to my childhood in Mexico, and I've already tried some of the recipes and really loved them. Another nonfiction that I read was Who Got Game, Baseball, Amazing But True Story. Everybody knows about Babe Ruth and Hank Aaron, but these are lesser known heroes of baseball and it tells kind of the untold stories. I also read Made by Hand Guitars and I gave this one to my dad because he's a guitarist and it has really cool illustrations and, and photos and everything and tells all about the history of guitars and how they are made. I also read Be the Dragon, Nine Keys to Unlocking Your Inner Magic, Roar with confidence and slay your fears with quizzes, quests, and more. This was such a cool, colorful book with really interesting little activities and little short stories. Such a fun little book. And those are all the books that I read in November. Please leave me a comment down below and let me know what was one of your favorite books that you've read recently. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and remember the right book in the right hands at the right time can change the world. Thank you.